So I, I've heard you say that mm -hmm. the physical form of a city will determine public health outcomes across yes. income levels and yes. education levels, and ages, yes. interests. Yes. Yes. Um, and I'm very curious. Um, could you make that vivid for us and give us some examples? And sure. also, while you're thinking about that, um, how we might specifically make choices for the future of Lake Wales that will have public health payoffs. Absolutely. Well, first, I would say there are certain fundamentals that we know. There are three aspects of the world that we know have huge impact on our health. And this is like 50 years of research on the first one, which is social interaction. We, people all across the world, all different economic strata, ethnic groups, cultural groups, the one greatest predictor of your longevity and health is the level of social interaction. And that social interaction is beyond our families. It's the people we see on a daily basis. It's a larger world of social interaction. I remember hearing Susan Pinker speak about this, and she said, yes. it isn't just the people you know, or it's, the people whose names you know. It's yes. that uh, person who prepared your coffee at the coffee shop that you said good morning to. That's exactly. part of that interaction you're describing. Exactly. And the second is physical activity. So this in 2000, so the, the social interaction studies were from the 1980s and then they've continued and they've been kind of reasserted and revalidated. Physical activity starts to become really an issue in, I would say about 2003 when Dick Jackson did that seminal issue of the American Journal of Public Health. And he looked, he had Larry Frank and the CDC people in Atlanta and they looked at Atlanta and they found that the people who spent more time in cars this makes sense, right? Had uh, worse health outcomes in, in the sense of like more heart disease, higher levels of obesity, diabetes. And they found that people who had more physical activity were healthier. And then because we live busy lives, I was kind of interested in, okay, how much physical activity do you actually need in a day? And it turns out that 10 minutes of walking a day can make an enormous difference in health outcomes. And then there's a third aspect, which is where our team has been working, which is greenness. And we did a study of about 250,000 Medicare beneficiaries in Miami-Dade County. And we found that our beneficiaries who lived on blocks with higher levels of greenness had lower levels of heart disease, lower levels of depression, lower levels of obesity, um, lower levels of dementia, even lower levels of Alzheimer. And then Miami-Dade did something interesting they, between 2011, I think, and 2016, the Million Trees Miami movement was launched, and the idea is to get Miami Day to a 30% tree canopy. So on the way to that, some 250,000 trees were planted. So we were able to now look at people who were on blocks that had low levels of greenness and had tree plantings. And what we found is that those tree plantings could predict better outcomes, lower levels of disease than one would have expected for that same neighborhood with its other trajectory. So where this gets us is back to where you started all this when you were describing you know, the livable network and the traditional neighborhood, because in a traditional neighborhood, we naturally had social interaction. We walked down the street, we waved at people, um, if the person who's elderly and living alone and they weren't sitting on their porch that Monday morning, someone would know and they would knock on the door and they would see what was happening. There's a level of caring and interaction. But all of those interactions that uh, you talked about, it turns out that the casual interactions are really good for our brain. We stop, we think, things happen. So, And then we would have been walking. So that's the physical activity part of it. And likely we would have been exposed to greenness because we would have been in one of these leafy neighborhoods if we were really lucky, or we could have spent our lunch break in a park. So when we took all that apart and we moved the houses out here and you had to drive in your car. So the first thing you did is you wake up and you get out in your car and you drive to work and you get in the parking lot and you go into your office and you order food in, there's just, there's nothing happening in that realm that's good for us. And so I think what's so important about aspirations that are the ones that we're seeing in the Lake Wales list is it's about reintegrating naturally these aspects of life. You shouldn't have to go spend money on a gym to be physically active, right? You shouldn't have to join a club 
to find social interaction. It could just happen in your daily life. And then everything you do on top of that is extra. You know, that's a choice. But for all of our people, for all of our citizens, the street network, the blocks, the buildings, the land uses, those should be the network of a healthy life. And then from there, we can make our individual choices. But all of those things that we say, well, you know, how you live is your choice. Well, it's not really your choice if you have to drive everywhere, right? And now we have a new directive. And that new directive is that we're responding to a warmer world, a world where we have more frequent storms, and where we have to really think about the climate as, um, as, a, as an entity that's making a, a significant impact on our lives. We in Florida, the climate has always been our benevolent friend. People come here for the climate. My dad always used to say, as long as there's sunshine, people are coming to Florida. And it's true. However, now we know the corollary to that is that we need to think about shading and cooling, right? We need to not use so much energy in our homes. So again, if we come back to this green network, we can imagine not only is it the building materials or the way that we use prevailing breezes, but it's also how we shade and cool our streets. We have, Florida has an enormous number of outdoor workers. This is true in Lake Wales as well. So, you know, air conditioning isn't gonna solve their condition. But greener streets, greener landscapes, parks, I think in general, we understand that we want to lower our carbon emissions and we want to have a more sympathetic approach to the place that we live environmentally. And the best thing about that is that's actually what's good for us, too, because those are the things where we're outside, we're walking around. So we're not trying to set one thing against another. We're trying to weave these things together to build a better life for ourselves, for our families, for our communities. And I think that now that we have the, the data that show why this works, why it's better from a health point of view, better from an economic point of view, better from a climate point of view, it's just as if everything is lining up to say, yes, let's do this, let's do this together. Joanna, well, last week um, we had a symposium in Lake Wales and we had a kickoff community meeting mm -hmm. and we did a little keypad polling to see how people in the audience felt about certain subjects. And um, and one of the questions we asked, was we asked everyone how they normally move around. 96% yeah. of the people said they normally move around by car. Yeah. Then we asked, are there some trips that you're making by car now mm -hmm. that you would rather make by walking, biking, or using transit if better options were available? And by better options, we meant, say, a tree-lined street so the sidewalk right. faded. Right. Or protected bike lanes so you could take a bike ride without stress yes. uh, or fear, for, fearing for your life yeah. uh, or more frequent transit service, those kinds of things. Interestingly, that audience, 70% of the people in that audience said that they are making some trips by car they'd rather make by walking or biking. And I thought okay. that was pretty significant. Yes. Um, so let's look at bikes for a second, just as mm -hmm. an indication of this. The, I read a few years ago that if you live within half a mile of a class one bikeway, which means a protected right. trail or bike mm -hmm. lane, um, then you are 15% more likely to get your recommended daily exercise. Yeah. And at first I saw that number and I thought, oh man, 15%. That sounds like such a small amount. And then I stopped to realize uh, on a population basis or to a public health. Uh, and yes, that's huge. Yeah, fifteen percent against these predicaments of hypertension, heart disease, and early onset diabetes, and childhood obesity, and so on. Fifteen percent was enormous. It, it, was, you would, it would spend almost anything to try and get the the needle to move that much because it's worth trillions. Exactly. Uh, in savings for the the patients and the system, including and, government. And even more, Victor, it reduces the suffering that families have when people are ill. And there's a lot of, a lot of people are talking about the fact that the baby boomer generation is completely unprepared to be in retirement age. And part of that has to do with financial situations, but part of it has to do with the kind of care that elders are needing. And some of that has to do with the fact that we've isolated our elders and they aren't really part of the community. And many people who live in suburban houses who no longer can drive and they're not feeling well, like they can't go anywhere and they're trapped in their homes. And so that's when you start 
triggering all of these different kinds of care levels. So I think it's huge to be able to start to integrate this kind of, I mean, the social interaction, I wouldn't, I think that piece is super important. We don't think about it a lot, but to just be able to go out on your street and to be able to walk to get your basic needs. We have hurricanes, right? After a hurricane, if the only way you can get food or water for your family is to drive and the roads are covered with trees, that's not going to work. But I saw, for example, in Coconut Grove, when we had one of the uh, Hurricane Irma came through, which really wasn't even that bad a hurricane here, but it took a lot of the trees down on Main Highway. Fortunately, we could walk to the center grove. And it happened that Green Streets, the local uh, restaurant there, had a generator and they had ice and they had water and, and people were walking to be able to get their basics. So I guess I just, I feel like this is so central and so important. And that's why for a place like Lake Wales to set a path forward that other cities in Florida can look at and say, this could be us. We could be doing this. It's we have really 1,200 huge. people a day trying to come into the state. There you go. 1,200 people. And of them, a lot of them want to be in greater Lake Wales, Winter Haven, Lakeland yes. area. Yes. Uh, because they're looking at the hazards of living on the coast or the cost of living on the coast. And they're thinking maybe the ridge is well, the place to yeah, go. So. And- we have right. a lot of and pressure. Lake Wales has the high ground, literally, right? right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So those are the people that um, are going to need the better options that mm-hmm. you've been describing. Can you take just a minute and describe if someone leaves their home yeah. in the Lake Wales of tomorrow, what you'd hope they'd find from their doorstep or threshold? Onward? Sure. Well, I would bring Maria Nardi, who's the director of parks at Miami-Dade County. Maria always says, parks start at your door, right? And Olmsted believed that too. And I think it's kind of in the charter of Lake Wales. It's certainly woven into these aspirations. So I think that stepping outside, it would now... I think there are different ways to do this. Some people may want to live a little more remotely and on a larger piece of property, and that works too. But for the people who want to get closer to town, they should be able to be on. A, they should be able to walk outside. Ideally, there's some kind of porch or transitional space. And I say that because our study of elders showed that our elders who lived in buildings where they had balconies, stoops, and porches had better mental and physical functioning over the five-year period of the study than the people who didn't. And again, I think that goes back to the social interaction. You you can sit on a porch and wave to people. You don't have to go through the energy of cleaning your house and inviting them in, but you can still have that level of social interaction. And you can contribute to street life, say hello to children. We found, for example, that our elders on porches, the children would walk by on their way to school and say hello. And some of them would come and sit and do homework for Till their parents got home. So there's an interweaving of the community that happens in the porch space. The sidewalk is the next level of that. And then streets that are safe, safe for bikes, safe for people to drive without expecting to have someone go, you know, 40 miles an hour on a residential street. So the kind of complete streets notion that you described. And then Marie and I have talked about this because We really believe in Florida, especially with the hazards that we face, everyone should be within a five minute walk of basic supplies. I'm working with a group on um, resilience and spinal cord injury. David McMillan is leading this at the Miami Project. And one of the things that we've learned from some of the interviews with people who have spinal cord injuries is they would love to be able to go out of their building and get their basic needs within a, a, a safe wheelchair ride. And a safe wheelchair ride means that it's not flooded because an electric wheelchair does not do well with water. And Florida, as it happens, has a lot of people who come here because of our benevolent climate and they have these various abilities. And so I would say making these uh, five minute walk universally accessible so that you could do it in a walker, you could do it with a baby carriage, you could do it in a wheelchair. And if those little five minute units all linked together through the green network, well, then we'd have this amazingly well-integrated townscape. And we'd have opportunities for people at all income levels. And we'd have opportunities for people to meet people every day who are new, that they didn't know the day before. And, and honestly, like that's the healthy life. 
these sound like ways to cut costs and improve benefits to individuals, but they also sound like ways to make a neighborhood competitive mm -hmm. against the competition. It might be charging a little less for the um, the conventional sprawl subdivision or yes, or the um, charging a little less for the retail space that's out on a, a strip behind a parking lot. And uh, so thinking of design as like Wales' competitive advantage and as a benefit to the bottom line, mm -hmm. not just as an extra cost, would seem to flow from everything you just described. Well, and as you've pointed out in your work, each place has its own authentic self. And if you can key into that with the people who are there, then each of these also becomes a destination for other people to visit. I, I'm thinking of sort of the Lake Wales Northwest that has this amazing, you know, it has an incredible history in the music industry, right? So that just when the students, the University of Miami students were there, they thought this was magical. Like, this is a great opportunity to find, make that the kind of destination that it once was. And each of our places in a community has that profile and destination so that it works for the people who live there every day, but it also has enough kind of businesses to be an economic engine that feeds back into the city in the way that you described. Because you don't wanna carry the economy of a city on the backs of its homeowners only, right? The business community is crucial in that. And then interweaving the identity of the business community and its draw for the homeowners who are around it and the renters and the tenants, it just creates this incredibly lively universe. And, and, and I think that that's something that you've been achieving with the Lake Wales Connected Plan. So I feel when I look around at Florida and I see who's doing what, I feel like Lake Wales has all the pieces and moving it into the next iteration is going to be very exciting. 